The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We are here this morning to study in major Bible themes. That's what we've been working on for some time now. And we're here to resume our study in major Bible themes. We actually will. Uh, I spoke about moving on into angels this week. And we may get a start on angels this week. But I want to go back and take some time to make sure we're solid on the covenants. That we're solid on the covenants. I don't actually have a handout for the angels yet because I'm actually still working on that. Uh, we've had three sections in a row now that come from the major Bible themes that uh, I teach a little bit different than what Chafer has in the book. And so for the Dispensations and Ages, I had to put together uh, a lot of work on that to get it together the way uh, my understanding of God's timeline is. And then for the covenants, I taught that a little bit different as well than the way that Chafer has it in his book. And then now for angels, I want to actually include a little bit more in the study of angels than what he has in his book. But I have started on the study, and we might get to a little bit of that here today. We'll see how the Lord works out the timing of it. Uh, before we get started, it's uh, important that we are indeed prepared for a study of God's Word. So let's take a moment of silent prayer in order to make sure that our hearts are indeed ready to receive the Word of God implanted. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the rain we had this morning. What a glorious thing it was to wake up and hear the sound of the water falling on the roof. And just thank you for the way you provide for us. And we ask that you would, again, provide more rain for us as, as this, your timing is perfect. And uh, we do pray for the upcoming baptism and picnic, that if it is your will, we would have nice weather for that. Father, I thank you so much that... Larry and Mona were able to make it this morning. What a delight it was to see them. I pray that you would continue to be with Larry and help him to, to heal from this uh, situation and, and be with Mona also and strengthen her uh, as she comes alongside Larry. Father, we thank you for this time to gather this morning and study the truth of your word. And we thank you that we have the opportunity to grow every single day as we learn from your word, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in His most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, before I, uh, before I move on, I actually have a couple of things I'm going to print here. But uh, in the meantime, I was going to talk to you guys about, about what all... Uh, I've been talking to you guys about Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. We've been having that as part of my exhortation for a while. A couple of documents I want to get printing here real quick that I forgot to print earlier. Let's see, how many copies do I need? Yeah, I got an idea. All right. We have been talking about Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and the encouragement that we can get from that. We can focus our eyes upon our Savior, the one who died on the cross for our sins. And it should be an encouragement to us. And we've been, ex we've been exhorted to lay aside every encumbrance that uh, so easily entangles us. And um, one of the things we want to keep in mind with regard to that is it takes a focus in our lives. It's more than just, this is more than just a simple uh, one-time decision. Right? It's more than we make a decision one time in a day, okay, I'm going to try to lay aside some of the things that are an encumbrance to me. It really takes over and over and over the choices we can make in order to glorify God with our lives. We've got to realize that we cannot possibly glorify God if we're running around and living our lives in a way where you're, we're trying to satisfy our own desires and not taking into consideration at all the will of God for our lives. So we need to remember that Seeking after God's will, pursuing it, that's the key word, the idea of pursuing God's will uh, for our lives is critical in order to be able to uh, fulfill what Hebrews chapter 
12 in verses 1 through 3 is talking about. What is the idea there? It starts with a single decision. That's where it starts. It starts with a single decision that, you know what, instead of living for my own selfishness, I'm going to live for God. I talked last hour about uh, a video that I just saw recently. I intend to show it here at the church at some point called In My Seat. Very powerful video about a pilot who was supposed to be on American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles on September 11th. But he was not because another pilot stepped in and took his place. He actually signed up for the flight and it was in the American Airlines logs and everything. But then another pilot came in at the last minute and asked if he could take that flight. He wanted to take that flight. So this other pilot, the one who did the video, was not on Boston, I mean American Airlines Flight 11. And as a result, he's alive today because that was one of the planes that went into the Twin Towers. It was American Airlines Flight 11. And so he tells the story about that and how he realizes vividly now that God has given him additional days. He was going to be on that flight and in the sovereignty of God, he did not put him on that flight and he's given him additional days. And he sees no sense in wasting any more time on selfish and fruitless things. He now understands that whatever days he has, every single day is a precious gift from God and he wants to live that day in a way that's in service to God and for Him and for His glory. Now, that's, we shouldn't have to have traumatic, exceptional events in our lives that bring us to that place. Instead, we should just reach a point in our own walk, in our own faith conviction that, what am I doing here? Why am I running around doing things that are totally self-serving? Why am I not considering what God has for me to do? Why am I not dedicated to the one who sent his son to die for me? Why am I not dedicated to the son who died for me and rose again and is now at the right hand of the Father? What is wrong with me? I mean, that's, I had an epiphany in my own Christian walk when I was at Austin Bible Church, and I was like, I need to be about my father's business. Why am I piddling around with all this other nonsense? I need to be about my father's business. And that's when I started actively pursuing my gift. That's when... Um, I started teaching some Bible classes at Austin Bible Church. That's when the pieces all fell into place where I started doing some training in the Greek and the Hebrew and all the other things. Uh, it was a matter, it was a, it, that single decision was the start of it. That's what I want you to understand. That single decision was the start of it because I decided one day I'm piddling around doing foolish things. It's time to be about my father's business. But then that was followed up by decision after decision after decision after decision. I can promise you that when I was in training at Austin Bible Church, I was stretched to the point where I thought I was going to snap in two. Because I was trying to hold down a job, even though I was only working part-time. I was trying to hold down a job. I was trying to support my family. I was trying to learn and study all these things. I mean, the, the, the folks that have come in and taken the... The Greek classes understand. I used to spend anywhere from four to six hours a week on my Greek homework alone. That was just Greek. And then there were all the other courses. It was intense. And it required decision after decision after decision that, yes, I'm going to continue down this path. So at some point in my life, I made the decision, I need to be about my father's business. But then, believe me, there were multiple, multiple decisions over and over again. I'm going to stay on that path. I'm going to stay on that path. This is not an easy path, but it's a path that I know the Lord wants me to be on and He'll see me through. So what I am encouraging you today is that out of that Hebrews 12 passage is that if you're not on that path already, if you're still living your life for yourself, then it's time to make the decision. It's time at some point the Lord's going to convict you and into making the decision. Instead of living for myself, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to live for Christ my Savior. And when you make that first decision, I'm telling you ahead of time that it will be followed up by decision after decision after decision that you will need to continue to make. That is the idea that you're going to follow the path that God has laid down. You are going to run the race that has been set before you, right? And that means at times you're going to only be able to see the very next step. That's all God's going to show you. Because if he showed you all of this out here, you'd probably be scared. You probably would be too, uh, too nervous about what is out there in order to make the next step. So sometimes in your walk, that's all you're going to know is, I know God wants me to do this. And then you have to make the decision. This is what I'm talking about, the over and over decisions. You've got to make the decision. Okay, he wants me to do that. I'm going to do that. 
And I'm not saying there's going to be some time, there aren't going to be some times when you're going to veer to the right or the left. That happens in every believer's life. We're all sinners saved by grace. We wander off the path and God gives us that loving hand of discipline that puts us back on the path. What I'm telling you, though, is that life is short. You know, I had this little minor health scare this past week when I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if maybe I had some kind of a heart condition or something. Who knows? I still may. We haven't gotten the results back from the blood work and they haven't gone in and run the tests. I may have some kind of a heart condition. My life could be over today. I could fall over dead right now laying on this floor. It could be over. Life is short. Why are we piddling around wasting our time on fruitless and frivolous things? It's time to be about our Father's business. It's easy. You can say, well, that's easy for the pastor to say. That's what he does, right? He's the pastor of the church. That's important for every single born-again believer. Every single believer needs to make that decision at some point in their own Christian walk that I'm not going to be about silliness anymore. I'm going to be about my Father's business. But then get yourself ready because the adversary knows that. And he's going to try to get you to veer off that path He's going to try to get you to go back and say, well, forget all that. I'm going to go back to my selfish ways. It was easier. It was easier just to be selfish and to do my own thing. Believe me, there, I, I'm not going to name any names, but there, I, we, we know about believers who have made that kind of a decision, who were on the path, who were following after God, and then they decided for whatever reason to follow after their own selfish interests. And that could be anything from uh, a love interest that can pull you away. That can be work. They can absorb you. That can be whatever. Whatever it is in your life that can be made an idol, it can draw you away from God. And that is something that the adversary is going to try to do the moment that you decide you're going to be about your father's business. But I can tell you right now, I have never once regretted that decision. I hope I don't turn away from it because that was the single most important decision I made other than placing my faith in Jesus Christ. Placing my faith in Jesus Christ was obviously the most important decision I've ever made in my life. But second to that is the decision to follow after the Lord with my life. Now, I'm not saying I don't make mistakes. I do. But that was an important decision. I'm exhorting you and encouraging you. If you haven't made that decision, if you're not doing that already, think about it. Why not? Why are you not doing that? Life is too short. The time is now. The sooner you can get started down that path, the more spiritual blessings you will know. Trust me when I tell you that. You might suffer physical trials in this physical world we live in, in this cosmos system, but spiritual blessings await. And there's difficult decisions to be made, but spiritual blessings await. So that's my exhortation to you today, is to follow after what God has for you. Now, I want to follow up to what we looked at before on the covenants. I'm getting back to our... Uh, our study now. When we looked at the New Covenant, and I talked about the New Covenant, and I know that some of you were kind of looking at me like you weren't sure what I was talking about, but that's okay. This is something I've been chewing on for a long time, by the way. The last covenant we talked about was the New Covenant. And there's no question about it. The New Covenant is with the people of Israel. It's an unconditional covenant, unlike the Mosaic Covenant. This is all review. God promises He's going to write the word on the hearts of all the sons of Israel. They will be faithful to Him. Israel will finally know the Lord as they should. The covenant is not made with the church, although we are server ministers of this covenant. We saw that in 2 Corinthians. That's an interesting word, an interesting phrase, the diakonoi. We are the server ministers of this covenant. We are not recipients of it. We are server ministers of it. It's a ministry of the Spirit and righteousness. That passage talks about that. So our serving of the our server minister capacity with regard to the new covenant is a ministry of God the Holy Spirit in our lives and a, spirit, and a ministry of righteousness. As we minister to one another now, we are being trained for our ministry as the bride of Christ during the millennial kingdom. I'm convinced of that, but that's part of what's going on as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we minister to one another, we are being trained for our ministry during the millennial kingdom. The new covenant has its very basis in the blood of Jesus Christ, who is the mediator of the covenant. He is the only one who could be the mediator of the covenant, but it has its very basis in the blood of Christ. This covenant reaffirms the blessing aspect of the Abrahamic covenant by assuring the future salvation of the people of Israel. It's a done deal. It will happen. The people of Israel will be saved. They will be faithful. They will finally know the Lord as they should. Now, 
what I want to bring up now, and I know that's a little bit small. See if I can zoom it in just a little bit. Uh, it kind of will work. This is what we talked about last time that I was trying to highlight. The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ the blood of the covenant, the sacrificial death of Christ, these three are all the same thing. The blood of the covenant, the blood of Christ, the sacrificial death of Christ. They're all the same thing. This is what is the basis for the new covenant with Israel. So it has an impact on the new covenant with Israel. It is the basis for the salvation of all mankind. Now recognize before he came and died on that cross, they were looking forward to his coming. Right? So their sins were covered. The, salve, the, the work of salvation had not yet been done. But it is the blood of Christ that is the basis for the salvation of all believing mankind. No one is saved apart from the blood of Christ. Also, there is an impact on the angels. We kind of briefly talked about that. I'm going to talk about that more as we go into some detail with the, our study of the angels later on. But the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, again, those are all equivalent. Don't think that the arrow is pointing from up there. It's like it's the sacrificial death of Christ that pertains to the angels and something different applies to the new covenant with Israel. Those are equivalents. The blood of the covenant, the blood of Christ, the sacrificial death of Christ, those are all the same thing. And they're all the basis for, you know, it had an impact upon these three things that I have on the slide, I mean on the screen right there. The new covenant with Israel, the salvation of mankind and the angels. The blood, again, the first point here, the blood of Christ is the basis for the salvation of all people of all times, and salvation has always been by faith in the promises of God. It has always been. Nobody's ever been able to work for or earn their salvation, period. All the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Salvation is by faith in the promises of God. Believers in the church, this is what's kind of unique about us. Believers in the church look back to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and therefore are sprinkled with His blood. That's a phrase that's used in 1 Peter chapter 1. Sprinkled with His blood the moment they place their faith in Him. So in other words, the people who in the Old Testament times prior to Christ, they were looking forward to the coming Christ. Their sins were covered over. The idea of the atonement, the covering over. But now the once and for all sacrifice has been made. And so when a believer in the church, as soon as they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are sprinkled with His blood. That could not be done prior to His sacrifice. It's the idea, it's language that describes the blood being applied. I gave you the example last time. I tried to, hopefully it was helpful, at least I think I did, the one about the Passover. That when the Passover was instituted, the lamb had to be slaughtered, but that wasn't enough then the blood had to be applied to the doorposts, right? When the angel of God came around and he was looking, he was not looking for a slaughtered lamb, was he? He was not looking for a slaughtered lamb. He was looking for the blood on the doorposts. Now, we don't know. There's no biblical record of anyone who did this. But what if one of the Jewish families had slaughtered the lamb but did not apply the blood on the doorposts? We talked about it before, I think. The idea is that the firstborn son would have been taken because it required not only the slaughtering of the lamb but the, the smearing of the blood, the application of the blood. Well, that's what we have now is we have in the church, right? This is the, this is the dispensation that began shortly after the ascension, right? This is the dispensation that began shortly after the ascension of Christ this is the dispensation where we look back. This is the dispensation for the first time where, where we are looking back to the, to the lamb that was sacrificed. And so the moment we believe, the blood is applied. The lamb's already been sacrificed. The moment we believe, the blood is applied, right? The sprinkling of the blood. All right, point the third bullet down here. The blood of Christ is also the basis for the fulfillment of the new covenant with Israel since God could not sprinkle. Hang on just a second. God could not sprinkle Israel as He will do in preparation for the kingdom. We have saw that language in Exodus, how Moses sprinkled the people when the Mosaic Covenant went into effect. There's going to be the same sort of an idea, and, and that's a typology of it, right? But the sprinkling of Israel will take place in preparation of the kingdom, and that could not be done until the once and for all lamb had been sacrificed. 
right? This could not be done. What God is going to do in the new covenant, in fulfilling the new covenant, was not, it could not be done until the once and for all lamb had been sacrificed. And then he will sprinkle them with the blood. As Moses sprinkled the people with the blood, God will be the one who will sprinkle them in preparation for the kingdom. Remember, sheep and goats judgment, wilderness judgment, the beginning of the kingdom, there's no unbelievers on the face of the earth, right? No unbelievers. They're all gone. You have nothing but believers. That's when the Holy Spirit's going to come upon all mankind. And it's based upon the blood of Christ. That's, a, that's why God is able to do that. It's based upon the blood of Christ. Now, the last bullet down here, I moved it over so the bullet point's not there, but the last bullet point down there, Believers in the church today enjoy blessings similar to those that Israel will enjoy under the new covenant because we are operating in grace under the same blood of Christ. This is what I'm trying to teach about this is that it's the blood of Christ that's the common thing. We're under the blood of Christ. Old Testament, Old Testament believers were looking forward to the coming Messiah. Their sins were covered over. But now we are under the blood of Christ. We are in the age of grace under the blood of Christ. That same blood, which is the blood of the covenant, which is the blood which God will sprinkle in the, in the, in the way that the figurative... It was done in typology when Moses sprinkled them. But the blood will be applied. That's what I want you to think of. The blood will be applied to Israel at second advent as the kingdom is established under the new covenant. The new covenant with Israel. So I, the reason I'm emphasizing all of this is you've probably heard teaching, and if you haven't, you will, that we are somehow also under the new covenant. I'm convinced from my study of it that we are not. We are server ministers of the covenant. We have a role in, in somehow being God's fellow workers. Christ is the mediator, and we are God's fellow workers somehow with the covenant. We'll understand more about that when we get to the kingdom. But the bottom line of it is, we are not the recipients of the new covenant. We are not under the new covenant, but we are under the blood. We're under the blood of Christ, and those that are going to be part of the fulfilling of the new covenant will also be under the blood of Christ because the blood of Christ is the basis for both. Does that make sense? Did that Hopefully, did having it on the screen like that maybe clear it up a little bit better? That the blood of Christ is the commonality, not the new covenant. If you read, I mean, I think, uh, I think you were telling me you were reading a Grace Notes study on, the, on this and it was talking about how we are beneficiaries and, and we are receiving things from the New Covenant. But I think that's the wrong approach to this. The New Covenant is with Israel. The New Covenant will be fulfilled, yet future. It will be fulfilled at, at, at the second coming of Christ, the second advent of Jesus Christ. We are not under the New Covenant. We are server ministers of the Covenant, but we are not under the Covenant. Hopefully that makes some sense. I hope that made it easier. Any questions? Okay, here is a, a deal that's up on the website. I meant to print it up and have it where I could hand it. I did print them up, actually. They're back in the back if somebody wants to go get them. Uh, I actually printed out that lot, both of those. Uh, there should be 20 of them back there on the printer. This is a chart. It's a little small. Let me see if I can get it to go up just a little bit. Yeah, it wants to go too much here. Hang on. The covenants. This is a table that shows them all. That's about as big as... No, I can spread that out a little bit. There we go. Biblical covenants. I know that's kind of small, but there's a handout that Molly's going to get that you'll all be able to take a look at. And what this shows is the different covenants that we spoke about. The Edenic covenants, the Adamic, uh, Edenic covenant, the Adamic, the Noahic, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Land or Palestinian covenant, the Davidic and the new covenants. These are the covenants that we went over. Now, what is a covenant, by the way? Can somebody tell me what a covenant is? Contract, promise, yeah, some kind of a contract or a promise. That's exactly right. So these are covenants, and these are covenants that God made with man. And then the, the second line here shows you the scriptures where you can go find those covenants. This was something somebody spoke about. I don't even remember who it was. Somebody said it'd be nice to just have it all in one place where they could see the covenants, the scriptures that pertain to them, uh, the third line shows whether it's a conditional covenant or not. The Edenic is conditional. Uh, the Mosaic is also a conditional covenant. The rest of them are unconditional. And then the bottom one shows you the recipients. We had with the Edenic covenant, it was all of mankind, but at the time it was only Adam and Eve, right? <laughs> but it was all of mankind under the Edenic covenant. And then, of course, the Adamic was also uh, with mankind after the fall. 
then the Noahic covenant is actually mankind and animals as well. That's one thing we noted when we looked at the Noahic covenant is God promised mankind and the animals that he would never flood the earth again. Uh, Abraham and his descendants are the recipients of the Abrahamic covenant, but we see that in particular the land and seed, the land and seed portion. Remember we talked about Abrahamic. It was land, seed, and blessing. The land and seed aspects were reconfirmed to Isaac and Jacob. What that means is that, that the aspect of land and the aspect of seed goes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The aspect of blessing, however, is beyond that because it says all the peoples of the world will be blessed through Abraham. And that includes temporal blessings for those in his descendants that are not part of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob line. Right? It could be through Ishmael or it could be through Esau. There's temporal blessings for them, but there's also spiritual blessings through his seed, that is Jesus Christ, for all of mankind. So the blessing aspect is for, is for all of mankind, all of mankind. Mosaic covenant is with Israel. Land covenant was with Israel. Davidic covenant was actually a little bit more specific because it was for David and his descendants, but that's still part of Israel. And then the new covenant is also with Israel. So that's the covenants, and hopefully... Uh, my, the little deal we talked about with the blood of Christ will help you understand our relationship with the, the new covenant. Now, again, the, there's only one passage that talks about it. It says that we are server ministers of the new covenant. And in that passage, what we see, if, you st- if we were to go in and do a detailed study of that 2 Corinthians 3 passage, we would see that it's talking about a ministry of the Spirit, a ministry of righteousness, and the ministry that we have to one another. And so what we have to glean from that, since it's the only piece of information we have, is that we are server ministers of the new covenant and our role in that for now is that we minister to one another in Christ. Remember, we're in Christ and He's the mediator. And as I talked about last time, we also, are, we also serve, we serve Christ and we serve one another. Remember, I talked about the true baptism is the baptism of the Spirit, which we, with that baptism we are baptized simultaneously into Christ and into the body of Christ. So what that passage, that 2 Corinthians 3 passage kind of gives us an idea is that as server ministers of the new covenant, we serve Christ and we serve one another. Now what what that is going to mean in the millennial kingdom under the new covenant when it's enacted, or not, excuse me, not enacted, but when it's made effective finally for Israel, we don't know because the scriptures scriptures do not detail that. But that is our role is we are server ministers of that covenant. And hopefully we got that clear now. But that's all the different covenants. Now, one of the things that I was asked to do was talk a little bit about what we can learn from all of this. Because if you'll notice, uh, there are certainly covenants that affect us in terms of being part of mankind. But I don't know about you, I'm not, I'm not of Jewish descent. At least I don't think so. I'm pretty sure I'm not of Jewish descent. So the last five of those covenants don't affect me in terms of Uh, being a recipient of that covenant, right? I'm not a recipient of the Abrahamic or the Mosaic or the land or the Davidic or the new. So what can we learn from all of this? First of all, I already talked about the, we can learn about the faithfulness of God. We can learn about how in his faithfulness, he will, whatever he promises, he will carry out. And that, by the way, works in both directions, right? Because when we look at the conditional covenant, the Mosaic covenant, he promised that if you're faithful and you obey my commandments, here's what's going to happen. And if you're disobedient and unfaithful and follow after idols, here's what's going to happen. And he was faithful. He was faithful in either case. When they were disobedient, he fulfilled the cursing upon the people of Israel. When they were faithful, the the times that they were faithful, blessing came upon Israel. So he was faithful. So we can learn about God's faithfulness. We can certainly from the covenants, in particular, we learn from the Davidic covenant more about God's timeline and what he's going to be doing in the end times. But what does it mean to me today? Well, certainly, you know, this promise here in the Noahic covenant, God promised he would never again destroy the earth with water. He brought judgment upon the earth because the people of the earth had become wholly unrighteous. So how does that apply to you? Well, remember in 1 John, you may remember in 1 John when we studied the sin unto death. And the idea is that a believer, a believer can go so far down the road of backsliding or reversionism or whatever the word is you want to use, they can turn their backs on God and go so far down that path that God actually turns them over to their sins. 
And believe it or not, I'm still learning about this, and I'll be teaching you guys about it when I understand it more. But in Romans chapter 1, it actually talks about God's wrath for us today. When we think of wrath, I don't know, what do you think of in terms of wrath? You probably think of Sodom and Gomorrah kind of wrath, or you think about what's going to happen in the, in the uh, tribulation kind of wrath, or you think about these different aspects of wrath. But actually, wrath for us is different today. And it's, in, it's talked about in Romans chapter 1. Wrath for us is when God gives us over. That is the pouring out of God's wrath upon us is when He gives us over. As believers it can happen, but as unbelievers it can happen too. He can give us over to the lusts of our flesh. And we can degrade even lower than we were before. And as believers, ultimately, if we degrade too far down that path, He gives us over unto what's called the sin unto death. And we ultimately are taken out of this world. And it's an act of grace, by the way. We talked about this when we studied 1 John. It's an act of grace. Because what he does is if he allowed us to continue to stay here, we would just be throwing away our crowns. We would be throwing away our crowns, and one by one we'd be losing eternal rewards. And so by taking us out through the sin under death, he actually preserves some of the gold, silver, and precious stones that we will see at the judgment seat of Christ. But... This Noahic covenant, remember what, what this is all about, the promise of the rainbow. Look what happened, though, that led to that promise. People degraded to the point where there was no righteousness on the earth that God could find except for one family. Okay, that is happening. We are watching that same sort of trend happening throughout the world. Look at Europe. They talk about Europe as being post-Christian, post-religious, or whatever terms they use. The United States of America, really, I'll be honest with you, I think the United States of America, by and large, is already post-Christian. I mean, we still have believers here. We still have a remnant. We still have those who are holding things together, I believe, those who are still, still strong in the faith. But if you look at the nation as a whole, we're, we're all about secular humanism. This, this nation has turned away from God. And we are going down the same path that the people did when God brought the flood upon the earth. We should learn from that. We should be concerned about that. We should be in prayer as we saw last hour with Daniel, Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. We should be praying for this land, praying for the people, praying for those that are lost, those that are, those that are believers that are not following after the scriptures, that are walking in sin. We should, be in, in, we should be deeply burdened for what we see going on in, the, in this nation and in the world because what we see happening is that the, the apostasy of the end times is coming upon this land. So you can learn about that from the Noahic Covenant, the idea of how things degraded so quickly. It wasn't long after Adam died, by the way. It didn't take all that long after Adam died before you get to the point where you have a generation that's so corrupt that God destroys the earth with flood. Well, the Adamic Covenant, what can we learn from that? Well, what, what Adam and Eve certainly learned is they had, they had this covenant in the garden... Well, let's back up to the Edenic Covenant first. Let's look at that one, the Edenic Covenant. Uh, in that covenant, they, so they had an opportunity to be in an ideal environment, didn't they? With a situation where they could fellowship with God every single day. Fellowship with God every single day. You have that opportunity right now. But they blew it, right? Instead of taking advantage of that wonderful opportunity to fellowship with God every single day, they allowed the tempter to talk them into doing something because they had this idea that they could know things, right? They could know things. What a temptation is that for us, that we can know about things, right? There's all kinds of, of temptation in this world, of promises of things that we can know if we'll only go down this path or another. What are we really knowing? What kind of knowledge is that? What did James chapter 3 say about that knowledge, <laughs> right? That's wisdom that's not from above, that's wisdom that is evil, right? Evil kind of wisdom. It's corrupt. Well, we don't want that kind of wisdom, or we shouldn't want that kind of wisdom. So what can we learn from what happened in the garden? We can learn that as believers today, we have that same blessed opportunity to fellowship with God. Now, we don't do it in the environment that they did. They even had an ideal environment on the earth, you know, the Garden of Eden. Wasn't even difficult to grow things. I've got... I don't know about you guys, but I've got, I call it a black thumb. I try to grow things and I kill it. My wife's got a green thumb. She can grow things. But 
the impression I get of the garden from the way it's described in scriptures is you could just kind of throw the seed down on the ground and it would just grow. I mean, it was, it was not difficult at all to grow things in the garden. They had a great environment and they blew it, right? We've been given even much more. It may not seem like it because we find ourselves here in the cosmos system. We're in Satan's world. You know, Satan is the ruler of this, this world, the prince and the power of the air. We see that. But at the same time, we've actually been given much more. We have empowerment and capabilities that are just awesome, absolutely awesome at our, at our very fingertips, if you will. And we have the blessing of being able to be in a world like this. I want you to think about this for a second. We can have the blessing of being in a world like this where there's deceit and corruption and lies and just horrible things all around us all the time. And yet we can be in fellowship with God continually. Continually. God has provided for that. We can be in fellowship with Him continually. And you should recognize what a blessing that is and you should realize that when we step aside and we decide to go after our own selfish interests and we blow it just the same way that Adam and Eve did in the in the garden don't we so that's what you can learn from that is that every time we make one of those bonehead decisions to follow after our own selfishness we have uh, we've made the same dumb mistake that they made and and we think about it we think you know everybody I've heard people say it countless times man they were in the perfect place how could they do such a stupid thing now point the finger right back at yourself here I am in this perfect place and dwell with God the Holy Spirit. I'm the very temple of God. I've got fellowship with Him. I'm being blessed with peace and joy and all the fruits of the Spirit. And what do I do? I decide to go after the pleasures of the flesh. I decide to go after something selfish. How stupid is that? I'm pointing the finger at myself, by the way. So this is my point, is that we can learn from that. Adamic covenant, what did they learn from that? Well, certainly they learned that the consequences of the fall were even more than they already knew, didn't they? Right? They, they had been told, they had been told with instructions prior to the fall that the very day that you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will die. And they did. Now, you'll notice they didn't physically die. That was a spiritual death that took place. They were separated from God for the first time. And they didn't understand it, and they were scared, and they hid themselves in the garden. Right? But God sought after them, and he still was interested in, uh, in finding them. And I believe uh, that some people say that we don't know for sure if Adam and Eve ever got saved, but I believe they were. I think there's evidence to that effect. But nonetheless, here's the, here's the point. They learned that as a consequence of their selfishness, of following after the temptations of the adversary, not only did they spiritually die, but that they were going to physically die. You say, well, that was implicit in the instructions they had before. Well, maybe it was, but if you look at Genesis chapter 3 where it's outlined for them, he describes that they will go back to the dust of the earth. He makes it clear to them that they're going to die physically. It's going to happen. And they're, they now have toil in their lives, right? The difficulty in the childbirth, the difficulty in being able to make a living, you know, either to grow crops or to make a living. I mean, that applies to us today in terms of whatever we do in making a living. But there's toil in our lives now where there was ease in the garden. So the consequences of sin was even greater than they thought it was. Well, how about that for you? Can you learn something from that? A lot of times in our own lives, we try to minimize sin. We try to talk about sin and say, oh, well, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't, you know, I haven't stolen anything. I haven't well, you go ahead and go ahead and make up your own list, whatever it is that appeases your own guilt, right? But the fact of the matter is every single sin is exceedingly sinful. And this is what can, can re, you can be reminded of from the Adamic covenant is that the consequences of sin were even worse than they thought it was. They learned about additional consequences of their sin. Well, that's true in our own lives. Sin is exceedingly sinful. Thankfully, we are as children of God. We are under His hand of discipline when we sin. But we need to realize that every little sin has consequences. Every little sin has consequences. I talked to you guys before about how, in particular, God even goes on in the New Testament to tell us about uh, sexual sins and how those sins actually can have a negative effect on your very body that you live in. Paul talks about that. That's a consequence that people probably weren't aware of before, that getting involved in sexual sins can actually cause harm to the physical body that you live in. This is what I'm saying. We often 
We often minimize the badness of sin. Don't do that. Learn from the Adamic covenant. Learn from that that the consequences of sin are even greater than you think they are. Now, thankfully, the very loving hand of God and His discipline He puts upon us brings us back, and we know that in His forgiveness we're washed clean by the blood of Christ. We're washed clean and pure again. We confess our sins, and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know that's true, but that doesn't minimize what the sin was. It does not minimize the sin. Like I've said before, one little white lie would have put Jesus Christ on the cross. He would have had to have died a horrible death for one little white lie. There's no small sin. There's no small sin. So we can learn from all of these things. Again, from the covenants with Israel, what do we learn? We learn about God's faithfulness. But we can also learn something from, from the Mosaic covenant because what we had in this is we had the covenant promises given to Abraham and his descendants And the people of Israel who were under covenant promises that were unconditional were called out as a nation, were given God's law so that they would be unique among the peoples of all the earth. They would not adopt laws and customs of other lands, but instead would have laws all unto themselves. But what was the purpose of that? Not only to call out those people as a special people, but also to teach them about sin, right? It was to teach the people of Israel that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. In other words, no one in all of Israel was able to keep all the commandments, were they? No one was able to do it. In fact, as a nation, they failed. That's what we saw with Daniel's prayer. As a nation, they failed miserably. Well, that was supposed to be a teaching tool. It was supposed to teach them, you know what? We can't We can't possibly keep up with this. We can't possibly meet all the criteria of this. So we fall short. So what does that mean? It should have have invoked in them a burning desire to realize that they needed the very righteousness of God. That the only way they were going to ever be able to be righteous before God is if God did something to help them. And it should have highlighted the need for a Savior, for the Messiah. Well, what about in your own life? What can that do? It pertains to your walk, your experiential walk. Recognize that in your salvation, you had righteousness imputed to you. That's the biblical term for it, imputed. It was credited to your account. God did that on the basis of His grace and His love and His mercy and on the basis of what His Son, Jesus Christ, did on the cross. You placed your faith in Jesus Christ and righteousness was given to you. It was credited to your account. Not because you deserved it, but it was given to you. But what about your day-by-day walk? How do I walk day by day in righteousness? What can I learn from the Mosaic Law? What I can learn from the Mosaic Law is that when I try to do it on my own, I'm going to fall short. I cannot in my own power and in my own strength possibly produce God's righteousness in my walk, in my experiential walk. We're talking about sanctification here. In order to be sanctified in the righteousness of God, the only way that's going to happen is when I turn to Him. And this is not just stuff that I preach from the pulpit. This is real. This goes back to what I was talking about before in my exhortation about decision after decision after decision. You have to realize that when Paul spoke the words and they were written in Scripture, when he said, when I am weak, then I am strong, that was powerful stuff. Because what he was saying is, When I am weak, and then I turn to God and I rely upon His strength, then I am truly strong. That's what Paul was trying to tell us. And the problem is we have to realize day by day, moment by moment, am I trying to do this on my own? Am I forcing this? Am I doing it in the power of the flesh? Or is this something where I'm turning to God, I'm relying upon His strength, I'm relying upon His wisdom, I'm allowing Him to veto it if it's His sovereign will to veto it am i going to allow him to bless it bless it if it's sovereign will to bless it or am i going to force it to happen am i going to say you know i can i can make this happen right you know i i understand what that's all about i'm a pretty strong-willed guy but it but the lord has to break that will down that kind of a stubborn prideful will he has to break that down to get us to the point where we realize 
We have to depend upon Him. And that's what we can learn from the Mosaic Covenant. It was intended to highlight how they fall short. And if you apply that to your own lives, if you, I promise you, if you tried to keep that, you couldn't do it. You wouldn't be able to do it. I couldn't do it. And if we're trying to accomplish the works of God on our own, we're going to fail miserably. I have to rely upon God to help me do a Bible study when I'm trying to prepare a class. You guys know all about that. I have to rely upon God to help me have understanding when we do our Bible reading. I couldn't understand what I was reading apart from the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. I have to rely upon God for the physical strength to teach this Bible class. I have to rely upon God for, for financial provisions to be able to continue day by day in my life. We have to rely upon God for everything. And if, we're, if our eyes are focused in that direction and we're looking to God for all these things, then we're not trying to earn our own righteousness under our own system, right? That's the thing. We're not trying to earn our own righteousness. We're relying upon God and His righteousness, His wisdom, His strength, and everything else that He provides. So we can learn from all these things. Now, what about these, what about these other covenants down here? I'll close with this. These were, the, these were the reaffirming of the promises made under the Abrahamic covenant. But what we see here is God... Under the land covenant, God promised specifically that they would receive the land, but he also told them that when they were stubborn and obstinate, they would be kicked out of the land, didn't he? So when he made the, the promise of the land, he also gave them a warning that there would be generations that would be disobedient and obstinate, and, he would, and they would be removed from the land. When we see here with the, the Davidic promise, it's very similar because it's a promise of a throne forever, an eternal throne, a Davidic throne that would last forever. Jesus Christ himself will sit on that throne in the millennial kingdom. But there was also a warning there that certain ones of his descendants would not receive the blessings of that promise. So even though God is going to fulfill the promise in both cases, there were certain ones who in their disobedience did not get to enjoy the blessings of the promise. New covenant with Israel. God is going to ultimately fulfill that covenant for His people Israel. Again, that's a reminder of His faithfulness. His faithfulness to His people Israel. I mean, we, when, as we read through the Scriptures, we think to ourselves, why doesn't He just give up on these knuckleheads? Well, believe me, if He gave up on them, He'd give up on me. Because I'm easily as much of a knucklehead. But He doesn't give up on me. I have eternal life and His promise is good. And he's not giving up on his people Israel either. He is going to fulfill that new covenant with them. And it shows God's faithfulness and highlights that. So hopefully when we look over these covenants, it's a reminder to us of, about who God is and what he's doing and what it's like to live in his life. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't sure it would take this long. It ended up taking longer than I thought. But hopefully this was a good review of the covenants. And hopefully this tied the covenants now into your own lives where you can see, hey, this is, this is important stuff. Remember... All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's true of even a study of the covenants. Even though maybe the covenants don't apply directly to us, all of these things teach us something. Well, since we have run a little long here, and it is a communion Sunday, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to review the information on the covenants. Uh, we thank you for the lessons that we've learned throughout all this study. We thank you so much for all the wonderful, fruitful lessons we've gotten out of the major Bible theme study. And we pray that if it's your will, that you would let us have another study or two or three or whatever it is that your design has, where we can maybe look at the, the angelic realm and study on those, those creatures, those uh, part of your your created realm. Sometimes people want to worship the angels, but they're creatures just like we are, and they were created by you. So, Father, if we have the opportunity to study on the angels, we pray you would bless that. But for now, we thank you for our study on the covenants, and we pray that you would be at work in our hearts to help us to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling with which we've been called. We pray these things in Jesus Christ, most precious and holy name. Amen.